As mail ballots trickle in from last week, it appears that a batch of progressive candidates of color are shaking up the status quo in Democratic primaries. In New York, former middle school principal Jamal Bowman is claiming victory over House Foreign Affairs Chair Elliot Engel, who's been in Congress since 1989. In the neighboring districts, Richie Torres and Mondaire Jones both lead their primaries to replace representatives who are retiring after decades in D.C., leaving them poised to become the first black openly gay members of Congress. And in Kentucky's Senate primary, where National Democrats helped former fighter pilot Amy McGrath raise $40 million for her campaign, progressive Charles Booker holds a small lead, despite raising less than $800,000 himself. Grace Seegers and Sarah Ewald Weiss join me now to talk about their latest article breaking down the lessons from last week's races. It's up now on CBSNews.com with the headline, Progressive Newcomers Tout Mandate While Shaking Up Democrats' Status Quo in Primaries. Grace is a CBS News political reporter. Sarah is an associate producer for the CBS News political unit. Good to have both of you with us. Grace, let me go ahead and start with you. It's been less than three months since Bernie Sanders suspended his presidential campaign, making Joe Biden the presumptive Democratic nominee. What's changed between then and now? Seems like everything. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, the big news over the past three months has been the pandemic, as well as the protests nationwide over racial violence and police brutality. The whole field is completely different than it was three months ago. It's not just because Sanders dropped out of the race, but because the world itself seems very different. And because of the pandemic and the protests, that has given progressive challengers the opportunity to go out in their community and either protest or show their willingness to shake up the status quo when it comes to health care. So we're seeing this change, not only the country, but also the landscape of the campaigns. Sarah, can you tell us more about the energy that you're seeing out there um, as these new progressive faces are challenging incumbents or um, racing for seats that, uh, that have been in the same hands for so many years, if not decades? Right. Well, Grace touched on some of it. Um, but of course, this comes after the presidential primary, where Joe Biden, a moderate candidate, clinched the nomination. But Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren had huge grassroots support during the primary that cannot be dismissed. Of course, candidates after Joe Biden won the primary looked at that race and said, well, we can still make progress down ballot for progressives. And so that's where a lot of these activists have been channeling their energy specifically. Of course, as Grace mentioned, this comes in the middle of a pandemic. For the past three months, there has been an increased focus on down ballot races. People are looking at their local leadership, seeing what can be delivered to them in their districts. And it's something that has been put more into focus recently because of that. Of course, we have these national protests against police brutality and against racial, racial discrimination, systemic racism. And people are looking at the candidates. And I spoke to Mondaire Jones, and I asked him, how has that specifically changed your race? And he told me that he believed that he was on the way to winning the primary before the protests broke out across the country. However, he thinks that it increased enthusiasm having representation such as his in Congress. He said it didn't take national protests for people to, or for him to have a policy on police reform. It's been a part of the conversation for him from the very beginning. Others like Charles Booker, of course, were out in the midst of these protests. Kentucky, of course, has been the main focus for these protests with the death of Breonna Taylor. So that has really been something that people have been noticing what his actions have been on the ground. And it's been a swell of momentum in more recent weeks because of it. Yeah, Breonna Taylor's death certainly galvanizing um, a lot of people, especially around the idea of safety in one's own home and no-knock warrants. Um, Grace, as more moderate Democrats, especially those in leadership, are replaced by progressive newcomers, what will the impact be on how Democrats legislate? 
It'll certainly be interesting to see. So in 2018, we famously saw Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez defeat Joseph Crowley, who at the time was the chairman of the Democratic Caucus in the House and a very powerful member of the House. And now we are seeing Jamal Bowman likely defeating Elliot Engel, the chairman of the powerful Foreign Affairs Committee. And what we're probably going to see is a shift to the left in general policies. Now, these replacements won't necessarily automatically become the new chairs. So Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez did not become the new chair of the Democratic caucus, and Jamal Bowman would not be the new chair of foreign affairs. But it does show House leadership that there is a new center of focus and that they need to shift to the left and also recognize the priorities of these districts. One of the problems for Engel was that he didn't spend very much time in his district. And that was really a big reason why Bowman was able to come in and say, I know this district, I'm actually here, I'm doing the work. So it's really important, I think, for incumbents and leaders in the House to realize it's not all just about Washington. You need to look at the districts as well. Yeah. So, Sarah, you were talking about Biden as a moderate. I'm wondering if uh, if progressives and their supporters see potential problems with a more moderate Biden White House um, versus a more liberal option, even though we know that that's not going to be on the ballot. Yes, well, obviously, these candidates were more uh, supported candidates like Elizabeth Warren as well as Bernie Sanders. Um, they were endorsed by candidates such as Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders in their primaries, and that really gave them energy and drive. Uh, with that said, I have spoken to a couple of different activists, and they see this as at least Biden is someone we can work with. They are backing him in the general election. Now that it's down to Biden versus Trump, they say they can at least hold him accountable, and he has made some overtures specifically towards Bernie Sanders supporters in recent weeks and months in terms of policy. Um, what they say about Donald Trump is that they'll always be putting out fires and trying to save what they have, and there's no room for negotiation there. With that said, of course, it raises questions about the enthusiasm level. Uh, Joe Biden, people wonder if he has the enthusiasm, whereas Trump supporters are very enthused about their candidate. Uh, the Trump campaign has actually been really trying to push this narrative. Uh, the question remains, though, is maybe Maybe the candidates might not be as enthusiastic about Biden, but will they be as enthusiastic about unseating Trump come November? And that is where questions really lie for those who haven't been uh, in Team Biden from the very start. Absolutely. I know that they'll probably be looking, too, to see who he selects as the woman to, uh, to be by his side. All right, Grace Seeger, Sarah Ewell-Weiss, thank you for joining us. Thank you.